Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our monthly seminar on small ruminant management. My name is Sarah Jemanski. I'm the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources here in Perry County, Indiana. And today we have two guest speakers, Mary Rodenhus, who is my colleague from Franklin County, Indiana, and a longtime sheep producer, and Dr. Keith Johnson, who is our forage specialist you know, from the West Lafayette campus. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to them to go ahead and get started on hay evaluation for sheep and goats. Now, once we finish with this presentation, there will be a survey that pops up. So please complete that survey. You know, it helps us know how we did, you know, whether or not you learned anything and what we can do better the next time. And also, if you have any questions, please type them in the question and answer over on the right side of your screen, and we'll answer those questions at the end of the program. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Keith and Mary. Well, good day, everybody. It's sure a pleasure to be with you, and we're going to talk about hay evaluation. And Mary, I know, as Sarah indicated, you have uh, current and past personal experience with sheep, and, you know, I learned so much about children were in a 4-H project and um, we were had them for probably in the neighborhood of about 12 years and just what I learned was phenomenal about uh, goats in particular but uh, small ruminants in general and what we feed our livestock is such an important practice and hay is really a large part of sheep and goat nutritional needs in their lifetime. Uh, many sheep and goat producers probably raise their own hay but I would guess that some of our smaller producers will have the smaller flocks and herds do purchase hay. So as we think about hay valuation, first let's talk about the quality aspect and uh, what affects the quality of the hay that we feed our sheep and goats? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of things that can influence um, the hay, you know, either while it's growing or while we're harvesting. So. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the maturity of those plants. Uh, the the longer they stay out in the field, um, the more mature they get, the less digestible um, they be can become. So we decrease the overall quality as that hay matures. I know uh, back in 2019 was a terrible year for hay because we couldn't get that first cutting um, until at least a month later than we typically would. And, and that hay was so mature. A lot of those um, tests were coming back that they're basically equivalent to straw, almost like a really good filler instead of any nutrient quality um, in that hay. So definitely our maturity um, at the time we cut is going to be a huge indicator on our hay uh, quality. And then we look at the overall species that are in that hay field, right? You know, do we have uh, a legume out there, alfalfa, clover, that can help boost the protein and the nutrient quality of that hay? Or is it more of a grass mixture, which there can be really good quality grass hay that is good in the, the time period. And we'll talk about matching our, um, our hay to our production needs in a little bit. But uh, what is out there? And then do we have... Uh, you know, a lot of weeds or anything like that, those kind of species present that can decrease some of the value and that quality of the hay. And then we talk about the variety within some of those species. We've got uh, brown midrib and things like sorghum, Sudan, millet that um, has less lignin. And so it's a lot more digestible for, um, for our livestock um, and increases that, that nutrient quality um, of our hay. Or there's an intall fescue. We can have a low endophyte or novel tall fescue that is uh, much more preferred over that um, high endophyte tall fescue, which can cause just a whole slew of problems um, uh, for our sheep and our goats. Mary, <laughs> yep. Let me let me put make a comment. Uh, just a very exciting thing that's happened at Purdue through the course of some time, but uh, there is a business relationship now that is looking at durin free sorghum sedan grass, which means it will not have the prussic acid fear fractor uh, that oh. we worry about it at freeze time. So uh, good wow. deal. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, two or three years, there may be that available to our, and, and that's an example again of the difference within varieties or hybrids within a species. 
Yeah, that'd be definitely an awesome uh, variety to get out there because I know that's one thing that some producers don't uh, or they get a little leery of that sorghum Sudan and really have to watch. It, it can really cut the uh, grazing time on a pasture if we get a, a freak uh, frost or something. Um, and so that would be an awesome development uh, to, to implement into our pasture, into our hay. So We're actually uh, using sheep uh, to indicate the preference for this as compared to those uh, that are on the market. And uh, they find this equivalent or even a little bit better in terms of their preference for grazing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It'll be definitely a very exciting development. Thank you for adding that. I didn't know that yeah. was that was happening. So, yeah. Very cool. Uh, other things that can affect forage quality is going to be the the overall leaf retention, um, especially like the alfalfa and clover. And so you can see the picture on the left that's very stemmy. Uh, we've lost a lot of those leaves off of there, and those leaves are what have uh, carry a lot of that nutrient quality of the of the uh, legumes. And so this can happen from um, you know just kind of overworking it. If it gets rained on, you've got to reted it, rebale it. Um, and so if we just lose all those leaves, we're losing a lot of that hay quality. And the picture on the right is really good leaf retention um, and alfalfa. And, and again, that's that's really what we're looking for um, in those legumes. And then we've got pests. Uh, and a picture here of alfalfa weevil just decimating those leaves. Um, it obviously is going to affect, again, that leaf retention. We're, we're not going to have a lot of leaves left there, but also the overall quantity. Um, of that hay that we can produce and so insects can definitely have an effect diseases uh, and disease pressure can affect the quality and quantity of hay coming out of a field and then some weeds i know you got a, a fun story that you're going to share with us later but uh, if you've got any sort of um you know toxic weed or prickly weed that that those sheep and goats just aren't going to want to eat that hay um and so we're obviously going to decrease the the quality there you know, one thing, Mary, and, you know, just keep it where you're at, you're fine. But, you know, the picture of that alfalfa weevil uh, just reminds me how important it is to scout our hay fields and our pasture fields, you know, on a weekly basis. So you're out there looking at the beauty of those uh, uh, sheep and goats. Take time to look at the well-being of the forage, too, to make sure that we don't have problems with insects, disease, and weeds. Definitely. And if we can catch it a lot sooner and treat for that and get that under control before it, you know, just decimates an entire field, you're, you're going to be better off. Um, definitely in the long run. Absolutely. So, uh, and then we talk about environment. Uh, we always like that perfect hay making weather. And uh, in some recent years, we haven't had too great uh, of weather. My dad talked about this year. He goes, I really like, you know, we've got predictable rains and we've got a week long. We can get hay done and hay made. And he goes, I, I like this. This is the kind of weather I remember when I was a kid growing up and, and making hay. And um, so, but you got to have, you know, moisture can affect it. If we get random pop-up showers on rain, that's going to, again, we talked about having to rework or reted uh, that hay and, and just beat the crap out of the hay. Um, you know, that's, it's not going to have good quality after that. Um, and temperature and sunlight, how long that hay is going to take to dry out can really affect um, our hay quality as well. And, um, you know, it's a quick uh, topic on moisture. Uh, you always have to be really careful, not just because it can decrease the the quality of hay, but if you put up hay that's too wet, um, you always have that chance of that potential uh, combustion. And uh, my family, back before I was born, back in the 80s, um, we actually lost a lot of our hay um, and part of our hay loft because we they put up some hay that was a little too wet, um, and it just it caught on fire and took out that whole hay supply. And um, thankfully, we had really good neighbors um, back at the time that helped uh, come over and you know put the fire out one, um, but two helped us get you know hay that we could get through um, that season. We had dairy cattle back until about ten years ago, so hay was very crucial, and a lot of the neighbors kind of rallied together to make sure that they could have enough hay. Um, but it's, it can be very devastating uh, to take out your entire hay crop. And especially if you're buying a lot of hay, you may buy, uh, you know, all that you need for the winter's worth if you've got all that storage. Um, and if it's a little wet, you know, uh, can go up. And so we, we definitely don't want that to happen and, um, and to lose all that hard work and that money you put into that. So, yeah, there's something related to that, too, is I think people, when they purchase hay or do this themselves, you know, after a few days, uh, nothing's happened or maybe a week, but my observation has been that these structural fires that you talk about by 
hay put into storage too wet. It takes about three to four weeks for this to happen. So it's very, very important to keep monitoring hay and storage uh, with moisture uh, probes that are available and temperature probes uh, that actually can be purchased to keep monitoring this while the hay is in a stack during that course of time. Yeah, uh, you talk about those, uh, the moisture probes, you can get those, they're not terribly expensive, really, if you're going to um, be storing a lot of hay. Um, we, last year at FAIR, we have a, the hay project, and we had somebody turn in uh, this really gorgeous bale of green, lush hay, um, and it actually ended up getting a uh, reserve grand champion because it just, it looked so good. But the only reason it didn't get grand is because the judge did say, you know, it's, it's too wet. It's, there's too much moisture there. And as the week went on at fair, we kept checking it and kind of pulling it away from the other hay that was being displayed because we were a little worried. Um, it kept getting hotter and hotter. And um, one of our producers has a, a moisture probe when we checked it, it was over 50% moisture. Um, and so I actually had a talk with those, they, they were showing, um, uh, goats that week. I had talked to them. I'm like, I don't know what you've done with the rest of this, uh, wagon load of this, this hay, but I wouldn't store it for too long. I'd get it fed, um, and get it off the trailer and not put that into the barns. Cause it is, it's very wet. Um, and we think about that, that kind of rolls into our next point is, is if we put something up kind of wet, there's a lot more of a chance uh, to get mold growing in those those bales and uh, mold is going to affect um, all the overall quality and what the those sheep and goats can eat and uh, potentially make them sick. And so uh, increased moisture, not only uh, potential for combustion, but a much higher at risk for um, getting mold in those hay bales and um, decreasing that that quality of hay. And then the overall soil fertility, that's going to affect uh, if there's not enough nutrients in the soil. One, we're not going to get a lot of quantity. The, those uh, plants are going to grow really and thrive really well, but it's going to affect the overall quality and nutrients that we can find um, in the hay. And then we got foreign materials, uh, you know, name a dead a mouse, a snake, a bird can get in the hay, uh, pieces of glass, a Mountain Dew can. Um, when I was in grad school in North Dakota State, they do a lot of um, bailing the, the side ditches. Um, the side ditches there are fairly large. Um, and so to get some extra hay for the year, they, they bail those and um, talk about the amount of litter and stuff you can find in a bale. It's insane breaking open. and You've got to be careful um, finding glass bottles in there that are broken and cut yourself. And um, and you don't want a, a sheep or a goat to, to ingest any of that either and cause digestive issues um, later on. Uh, and then the, the dead snakes and stuff, those just start decaying. And then we, we get to those issues with uh, um, you know creating sick animals. Uh, and then if you're doing silage or baleage, you want to make sure that the pH is, is less than 4.5 um, because that's going to be the ideal fermentation of pH for fermentation. And if we don't get down to that 4.5, we've got an increased risk of uh, botulism and listeria if we're feeding those baleage um, or silage. And we don't, that's kind of a, you get kind of isolated cases with your animals. It's not going to uh, necessarily take out the entire flock, um, but when those go down, um, it, it, it's very unlikely that those animals are going to bounce back or get out of that, um, unless with the you know intensive treatment. And so, um, those bat botulism and listeria come from bacteria in the soil, um, but then correct fermentation will kill that. Um, but if you don't get that fermentation less than 4.5, then then that, that gives them a chance to kind of thrive um, in those bales. So want to make sure you definitely watch for that if you do a lot of silage or baleage. Yeah. Mary, I can actually tell you too that regarding the botulism, we've had two cattle cases in the state of Indiana and uh, one with horses in the last year and a half. And those are the ones I know about. So I'm sure there's some cases, but in one situation, uh, the producer lost uh, approximately half of the cattle that were on being fed that baleage. So it was big time problem. So it really is important to get that uh, pH if you're submitting, you know, traditional silages or baleage to confirm that we don't have that uh, cause of concern because the organism does not does not grow as you stated uh, when it's less than four and a half pH. Yeah, definitely. So if you're doing any wrapping any bales, uh, you're doing any you know traditional silage, you want to make sure you're getting that tested. 
Um, and we're going to talk about testing here in a little bit. Um, and then we got storage conditions. Uh, if you store hay indoors, um, you know, in proper storage conditions, you can keep retain a lot of that hay quality um, for many, many years. But if you've got it outside, it gets rained on constantly, you get that that heat and that kind of baking and, and torching it, um, you're going to lose a little bit of that, mostly just because those animals aren't going to want to eat kind of that, that moldier stuff or the stuff on the outside that's really, really wet. And um, so you want to make sure you're storing your hay um, proper conditions or you're using all of the hay that you buy in a timely manner so you don't have to store it for very long periods of time. Yeah, one of the myths that's out there is people are concerned about buying hay that may be a year or two old and I'm not fearful of that if it has been stored under cover yeah. and uh, you know obviously we need to make sure that those base bales don't have mold on the bottom which they can if we don't have proper storage uh, yeah. elevating them but uh, yeah, uh, don't think that just because it's a year or two old that it's inferior. Uh, we need to do an evaluation of that as we'll talk about, but uh, it can retain its nutrients if stored properly. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, it's amazing. You kind of see, take some of those that have been out of, uh, been stored in a hayloft or something for years, and they look just as green as the day they went in because they went up in really good condition um, and then have been stored watertight. So. Yep watertight and haven't seen sunlight. So, yeah. Yep. Well, you know, talking about all this tells me that uh, hay from cutting to cutting and year to year are not going to be the same quality because we have different uh, conditions as we go through seasons and years. So how do you suggest that we evaluate hay? Yeah, so first, I think it's really important when we think of buying hay that, you know, you want to try to work with the same sellers year after year um, and build up that working relationship because if you can work with those and the same individuals they start learning the needs and demands um, of your animals and it can help you know better match the the hay they're producing to those needs um, and sellers really like to work with the same people year after year um, so that they're not going out and searching it and um, you know finding the if you're a reliable hay buyer you know that's going to be really key in building that good relationship um, and then for you as a buyer, it just makes your hay that you're buying much more consistent. You know, if you can get on the same rotation, um, I get the the second cutting, I'm getting 50 bills of the second cutting every year from the same producer, you're going to increase your consistency of that hay um, year after year. But regardless of, uh, you know, that, that hay buyer seller relationship, I think it's really important that you do um, a combination of two evaluation methods, a sensory analysis as well as a chemical analysis. And that sensory analysis is really needs to be done before that you even make a purchase agreement. Um, go out and check and look at that hay and, and feel it and you know to get a good idea of what uh, you will be buying because once you buy it and it's back at your place and you start looking you're like oh you know this doesn't look as good maybe as i had thought it was or the pictures look like uh you're you're stuck with that you've bought the hay and now you've got to either find somewhere to feed something to feed it to um or you sit on that hay and, and try to destroy it somehow and um Chemical analysis is also really desirable. That's something that maybe not all of the sellers are going to do automatically. So you may have to request that or ask that. Um, and, and again, with the, having that relationship with the seller, they'll be a lot more willing and receptive to those requests and making sure that you're getting uh, the, the chemical analysis done so that you can properly balance uh, those diets. You know, I think about this chemical and that evaluation and if I were buying it and um, really had uh, a trustworthy seller, um, you know, I would certainly think of being willing to pay a little bit more for that hay if I had that evaluation, because it does require some time to do that. So I think you need to pay that seller for a little bit uh, per ton uh, if an individual goes to that uh, uh, realm of uh, doing a chemical analysis, but it is worth a whole lot. That's, that's for sure. Definitely. Well, you know, I really like the word sensory evaluation that you talked about. Um, too many people call it visual appraisal. And, you know, if you look at the slide that we're looking at now, yes, we use our eyes, uh, but we also have the senses of touch and we also have the sense of smell that comes into this. Uh, Mary, I've never been able to hear a, a hay bale 
uh, in terms of sensory analysis. Uh, I suppose I could taste it as well, uh, maybe, uh, if, if I went that far. But it's more than visual appraisal. And uh, we do use our senses. And, you know, what caused me to use the term sensory evaluation as compared to just visual actually came from a shepherd many years ago. And if you don't mind, I'd like to tell the story uh, that kind of brings this to light about why sensory instead of just visual. Yes, please do. I'd like to hear that. Okay. Well, so this goes back uh, in the middle of the summer. And a shepherd called me. I actually was in the office that day. And he said, uh, my ewes are refusing to eat this beautiful alfalfa hay. And... Um, you know, there's not much that I can do over over the phone uh, or even with much of a picture unless it was real detailed. And we, <laughs> as I recall, we didn't even have iPhones back in the time that this was happening to do that easily. But the shepherd boxed up this hay and a big sturdy box arrived a few days early, uh, later and I opened it up and it was beautiful. It was green. And I came to mind using my eyes, well, I don't see anything wrong with this. And then I put my hand in, you know, halfway into the couple of flakes that there were, and I quickly withdrew it because there was a trace of Canada thistle in this hay. And, you know, Canada thistle has those spines and uh, they really hurt when they're especially dry. <laughs> and um, so I, I said, okay, looks good. A uh, little trace, kind of hard to see, but it's definitely there. And it was kind of traced throughout those uh, few flakes. So I called the shepherd back and I said, if you don't mind, uh, go out and look at the mouths of those ewes and see why they might be refusing. And uh, he did. And he called me back in a half hour and he says, you know, uh, those lips and the gums and the cheeks definitely are irritated. And uh, we surmised it was from that uh, consistent trace of, uh, you know, uh, Canada thistle in the bale. And, you know, if I were them, you know, I certainly had empathy for sheep at that time. I never thought I maybe would have that type <laughs> of empathy, but I certainly did when I think about me chewing on uh, that uh, good looking hay. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, I was really bought into the importance of chemical evaluation, kind of put aside this whole visual uh, and sensory appraisal sort of thing. And uh, it, it led me to recall a study that was happening at the time uh, that this uh, call occurred. And this was done uh, at the University of Minnesota with the USDA group. They looked at the quality of about 20 different weeds and one of them was Canada thistle. And my recollection, and I went back and, and revisited to make sure my recollection was correct, but Mary, if, if you were to make your beautiful alfalfa hay and I were to take my crummy Canada thistle hay field and bale it up, and we'll talk about sampling properly, but if I were to sample properly and send the sample off to the lab and you were to send your sample of your corings of your beautiful alfalfa, we probably couldn't tell which was which, the alfalfa or the Canada thistle, because the quality of Canada thistle is very much like alfalfa. Really? Same protein, same fiber, you know, and so, this told me then that we just can't rely on chemical evaluation alone. We need to use this sensory evaluation to look for, you know, physical abrasions like uh, that, that can happen with uh, the prickles of Canada thistle. Uh, look for that glass that we, you talked about uh, that can happen. Um, I've seen many aluminum cans. Yep. Uh, you and I both have seen the dead and the wiggly snake in a hay bale. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to look for those sorts of things because a chemical evaluation is not gonna pull them out. And even with molds, they may be a little bit inferior in quality, uh, but you, know, you really can't tell from the forage analysis necessarily whether that particular forage has mold in it or not without sensory evaluation. So that's my, that's my story about, uh, about the alfalfa. And it taught me a value, valuable lesson. Um, you know, we need to uh, think about using sensory evaluation instead of just calling it visual. 
Yeah, definitely. So that story, you know, talks about the real importance of looking at something and trying to to visually appraise and also feeling. So using our eyes and our and our hands. But what can what can smell tell us about uh, the overall hay quality? Let me just give a warning. If you have allergies, uh, maybe have somebody else do the smelling. Okay, because <laughs> you you may have consequences for several days if you have allergies. But the nose does tell you if there's a musty smell even when mold is not visible. And I'm sure many of you that have fed hay uh, have even uh, dropped a few flakes and you see this looks like dust. Uh, that could be mold spores as well as dust, okay? Um, soil dust. So uh, your nose is gonna tell you about this mustiness. And the other thing is if you get a, a caramel smell, uh, that hay likely is slightly heated uh, not to the point necessarily of even forming a mold, but it's it really takes on uh, carbohydrates of bonding to proteins and it makes less protein available. And we can tell that by uh, a forage analysis. Yep. Probably not as many of you uh, have purchased hay that's had a preservative of an organic acid like propionic uh, and acetic acid on it. Uh, what that does, it's a preservative applied at baling it has a vinegar-like uh, smell to it. So if you get a smell of that, the question I would pose if you weren't told is, was there a preservative applied on that? You know, I don't think there's any fear at all uh, in terms of purchasing that type of hay if it was done properly. And according to rate, uh, the animals will still find this acceptable, uh, but that may be a smell. And uh, so those are some things that you can, you know, find with your nose or smell with your nose that, uh, you know, sight alone is not going to tell you. Um, you know, you mentioned chemical evaluation of the hay. Uh, what things should we be testing for? What should we ask for? And what does one do with the chemical analysis? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, a, a really basic uh, forage analysis is going to tell you um, how much moisture is there, so how much dry matter, and that's really important when we are formulating diets to, to calculate that dry matter intake um, and ensuring that we've got a balanced diet. Um, and that's something that if you work with a, a trained nutritionist that can help you um, help you with. And also to say, uh, tell you the crude protein um, of that forage as well as the available crude protein or the adjusted crude protein um, for our, our ruminants. Um, and then it's going to talk to us about neutral detergent fiber, um, or NDF, and acid detergent fiber, or ADF. And um, NDF is really that predictor of dry matter intake of that forage. Again, that's really important when we're balancing those diets. And then ADF is going to be a predictor of digestibility. So we talked about how maturity can affect um, our hay quality as, as our plants mature, they put more lignin in because as they get taller, they had to have more structure um, to support that height. And so they get uh, more lignin in and that lignin is not digestible in our ruminant animals. Um, and so as the maturity increases, our ADF uh, is gonna increase and our digestibility is going to decrease. And so that's a really important number when looking at our hay quality uh, is where where is that ADF and, and how digestible is this hay. Um, and then you, it's gonna have, uh, if it's a silage or a baleage sample, again, that pH uh, will be a, a real basic part of that test uh, to ensure that our correct, our ideal fermentation has um, occurred. And then um, if you're working uh, with a nutritionist to make a total mixed ration uh, for our sheep or our goats, um, it, it might be a, a important to ask for that mineral breakdown as well. Um, that's not something that's probably going to be on our basic test, so it may cost a little more, but um, having that mineral breakdown, it could be really crucial uh, for getting those total mixed rations done. Um, and then our cost per sample is going to be, uh, depending on our analytical method, about $15 or $38 uh, per sample. But again, the, the um, benefit we get from that, you know, is, is way more than that $15 to $38. So, um, and then when we think about that chemical analysis, once we get that back, we, we've taken our sample, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, we've got those results back, you know, work with the nutritionist to really like dive into what those um, results mean um, and then take that and be, help that allocate your hay for your growing or for your uh, 
you know, season. So um, if we've got something that's a little bit higher nutrient, a little bit higher protein, we probably want to save that for um, our lactating um, use. So that and dough so that we make sure we're getting proper milk uh, production. And if we've got something that's more of a grass, maybe it doesn't have the high of a protein, but still pretty good quality, we can we use that as a maintenance uh, forage uh, for those sheep and goats. And so using that chemical analysis will really help you allocate which hay is going to be fed at what time period um, of those animals life. Okay, so now I've got to think about getting a, a sample taken. What is the correct way to take a sample of hay to send it off to the lab? Yeah, so one of the first things um, I, I really want to mention is you don't want to take just, you know, a fistful of hay and do a grab sample. That's not going to give a very good representation of that entire hay a uh, lot. So you want to use a hay probe. I've got one here. This is um, the one I, my office has in the county. So um, this barrel is where that, that hay is kind of collected from. And then this is what goes into the into the hay bale itself uh, to take that in. Um, so a lot of extension offices do have hay probes that you can borrow. Um, some are uh, battery operated, some are you know, hand cranked um, or you work with electric drill. So uh, feel free to call your extension office and see if they have one. Um, and if they don't, a lot of counties do, you know, surrounding counties will, so they can be able to get you one uh, so you can borrow and sample your hay. Um, if the, the buyer, or if you're producing your own hay or if that buyer has not uh, provided a, a chemical analysis. Um, and then if you wanted to, if you're doing a lot of hay buying um, or if you're making a lot of hay and going to be selling some, you can buy your own hay probe at foragetesting.org um, is a really good source. And they have a lot of different resources on there as well in terms of forage testing. Um, in terms of taking the actual collection, you want to take 20 probings from each lot of hay. Um, and sometimes people can get confused on what a, a lot of hay is, and that's essentially going to be all the hay produced from one field. Even if you produce um, your hay on the same day, you, you crank out and get a lot of hay produced different fields, those different fields may have different uh, hay qualities depending on the soil fertility or the type of uh, species out there in that field. So it's really important that we break those up into different lots. Um, and then even if you have um, one field, say you have an acre field that you're bailing, you get a half an acre done, and then you get a pop-up rainstorm and you can't get the other um, part bailed that same day um, or, you know, even after that rain shower, if it wasn't too bad, you want to keep those in different lots and treat those separately because, the, again, that hay can affect that or that rain can affect that hay quality. Um, and so keeping those separate when you bail them so you know exactly where, where our lots are if you don't um, sample right away is going to be key in keeping that organized. I had a producer uh, that I worked with uh, earlier this spring that um, they were fertilizing their field and they realized they got through about a third of it and the applicator wasn't spreading the fertilizer correctly. And so they went and they fixed it and, you know, got the rest of the field done correctly. But he knew that he needed to separate those um, lots in that field when he was bailing to test because they were treated differently. The fertilizer was kind of a narrow rose on part of the field versus correctly spread in the other part of the field. So um, those will create different lots and that's in that uh, of thinking. And then from each lot, again, we want 20 different probings. Um, and if you have large bales, so large squares or round bales, you can take two probings from 10 random bales of that lot. Um, or if you have small squares, you can take one core or one probing from 20 different bales of that lot. Um, and then when we think about round bales, we want to make sure we're going in from the, the rounded curved side. Uh, because if we think about how a round bale is made with all the layers, if we go in from the flat side, um, we're just be getting one particular section of field and that probing versus going in from the side, we're hitting multiple layers um, and multiple representation throughout that field um, with that one probing. And for square bales, go large or uh, small, you want to go from the butt end of that bale. Uh, again, if we go in from the side, we're just getting one flake, one spot, one representation of that field versus from the butt end, we'll, get, we'll go through multiple flakes. And you'll get a much better representation of what that overall lot hay quality is versus just very um, kind of little ideas.
And then um, once we get those 20 corings um, from your lot, you we will put them, you can put them into a bucket, mix them up and then fill up your uh, yeah, giga gallon um, Ziploc baggie. You wanna make sure it's clean and not reused from something so that there's potential residue. Um, label the bag so your your name um and then your whatever you call that lot if it's you know mom's back 40 or you know front field so that you have an indicator of where that uh hay sample came from um and that's what they're going to call that sample in the lab and then it's really important to get that sample to a laboratory as soon as you can um so if you live fairly close to one and you can drive and take the sample directly there that's going to be uh that's probably your best bet but that's not the case in a lot of places and so mailing that you want to you want to probably overnight that sample um and get that to the the uh, lab as soon as possible um and you don't want to mail at the end of the week i always suggest mailing out on monday or tuesday so that it gets to the lab um in enough time that they can run that sample even if you mail out on thursday they may not get it until friday afternoon even if you overnight it and then it may sit there um, and wait until Monday uh, to be ran. And uh, what we're doing is, especially if you have an increased uh, moisture level, you're just opening up for mold to start kind of forming into that hay. And you're going to, you want that hay to be as fresh as the day um, you took that sample. So you have a really good idea of the quality of the hay instead of kind of sitting and, and potentially molding. Um, and if you're wondering, do I have a lab near me? Um, there's a, a list of certified labs again on that foragetesting.org, and that does a um, a really good resource to utilize um, when thinking about testing. Yeah, you mentioned this. I would even on that bag uh, where you put uh, what means something to you uh, to put. But I think it helps to do this on the um, form that you'll get from the laboratory. You should look for that form. Most of these will be online. Uh, and uh, to indicate what test you do want, and to also that will be a place there, what type of uh, forage is this? You know, is it uh, a grass, is it a legume, is it a mixture of both, is it a silage, and so forth. So that opportunity is there on that sheet that will come through uh, the certified laboratory that you utilize. Um, you know, the reason they use that uh, resealable plastic bag is the fact that if we were to send it in a, a paper bag, uh, what happens is you lose moisture and then as a result, it's not true to form when you start developing that ration. Uh, let's say you submitted a sample that was uh, baleage, uh, would be a good example of that. Put baleage in a, in a, a sturdy paper bag, well, it could lose 15% of its uh, moisture. And then as we try to balance that ration on a dry matter basis, it's gonna be faulty because the sample they received was uh, not of the moisture that it was on the day, as you said, that you took the sample. So that's why we want to use that plastic bag. You know, in soil testing, and I would say uh, also with uh, hay sampling, uh, with these cores, I would suggest the bucket that you put them in as you have the 20 probably ought to be a clean plastic type of button, bucket as, as compared to one of these galvanized types. Uh, particularly if you're looking at uh, minerals as a part of that, because if any bit of flaking uh, from that galvanization is certainly, as you can expect, to really give you faulty values. So clean, clean plastic bucket would be a, a good approach. Yeah. Well, and following these guidelines are important and you know, you shouldn't skimp. I know it's really easy to say, well, this is kind of a good physical cardiovascular uh, exercise <laughs> here and I'm tired after 10. Yep. Um, but really, we do need to take 20 to represent the lot. It's been shown by research that we get closer to true value uh, when we get to 20 corings or more. And so don't don't skimp. Uh, it's really important to take those 20 to represent the uh, lot uh, that you have. Yep. And um, the website that uh, is in green there, the www.foragetesting.org, is really a great resource. Uh, what Mary has talked about, it will have the sampling uh, information there in uh, detail uh, as well. Um, and the hay probes can be ordered there. And I think uh, just as a reminder, uh, Mary mentioned that many of our extension offices do have hay probes for loan. You know, I think uh, for those of you that belong to goat or sheep uh, organizations in your county or region, uh, if there's uh, resource dollars, I would say that may be a good uh, investment are these sorts of things that could be shared amongst uh, the membership 
Uh, and then, you know, if you really buy into this and uh, are doing this routinely, you might, uh, you know, uh, request that for your birthday and maybe you'll get a hate. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think uh, uh, it's important to uh, do this chemical evaluation as well as the sensory. Um, so when thinking of the, the chemical evaluation and the different kinds, I know there's wet lab and there's near infrared um, reflective spectroscopy uh, referred to as NIRS. Uh, can we talk about uh, that technique um, and a little bit how they kind of differ? Let me uh, say that uh, you mentioned you uh, must be a child of uh, beyond the 80s <laughs> or so that this research really kind of came into being about uh, the 1990s. A lot of work was done with near infrared reflectance spectroscopy and it isn't just in laboratories that measure forage quality. This is really a big part of uh, industry measurement uh, to look at uh, quality assurance uh, in industry. Uh, and in our case, it's evaluating the analysis in terms of uh, the protein and the ADF and the NDF that you're talking about. And, uh, you know, most cases a basic test is gonna suffice um, for sure. If you need something more specific, uh, the opportunity of uh, probably paying more money is there for more uh, detailed tests, but a basic is going to do. But what NIRS is, it measures the dif difference of reflectance of organic molecules in response to absorption of energy by hydrogen bonds with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in the near infrared region of, of the light spectrum. So that's why it's use of a spectrophotometer and it's in the near infrared uh, zones situation. And we go back to wet lab and we actually analyze those samples that were used to develop the calibration equations that then uh, give us a prediction of the quality. And it's, it's fairly accurate. Uh, it'll account for more than 90% uh, of the crude protein, NDF, ADF, and in vitro digestibility. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a great resource. Organic compounds, are measured more accurately than minerals. Although on an NRS test, a basic test, the minerals will be provided. Uh, if I were really working with that TMR and found it to be extremely important, I probably would look at uh, wet lab analysis preferred. But what is the value? I've talked about a little bit about the science behind this. Well, the value is that NIRS, near infrared reflective spectroscopy is, the turnaround time is a lot shorter. As a matter of fact, if you were to hand deliver that uh, sample to uh, a certified lab today uh, in the morning, I wouldn't be surprised by the next afternoon, uh, the day following, that you'd probably have your test results back. Oh, wow. So, you know, that requires them to dry the sample, grind the sample. Uh, and you can see in the picture there in the lower right, uh, uh, taking a representative grind of the sample you sent in, put it in that cuvette, put it in the spectrophotometer, and in a matter of uh, 30 seconds, it's got the analysis complete. So wow. turnaround time is, is, is something, and the cost is less too, because they don't have the investment of a lab technician as much a time doing the wet type of chemistry that uh, okay. all of you have probably experienced in some high school or college <laughs> class. So uh, that's the value of it. And, uh, you know, most of these laboratories have that as an option. So we wanted to talk about that today, Mary, because we didn't want people to have an understanding about, okay, do I do wet lab or do I do uh, NIRS? Because those options will be there. Well, uh, what, what is the take home message, Mary? Uh, kind of at that point of our presentation, um, what, is the, what is the take home message? Yeah, so I, the take home message that Keith and I really want uh, for you guys is that we want you to stab your hay. We want you to sample, you know, take those 20 probings uh, from the different bales from the same field and harvest, uh, take those and test, uh, and send to a certified lab for analysis. Um, and the request, again, that basic is going to have the, the dry matter, the crude protein, NDF, ADF, uh, pH, and then you can add on minerals if you're doing a, your total mixed ration. Um, allocate that hay, 
you know, review your test results and allocate that hay based on where your animals are and their production needs, um, and then balance. You take that sample to a or that result to a, a certified nutritionist and um, balance those diets so that you ensure that you're meeting all of their nutritional demands. So, are there any questions for Keith and I? Again, you can put those in the chat box or the Q and A um, Q and A box. And Sarah, do we have any questions? I do not see any questions. We did a good job explaining, then Keith. <laughs> there you go. So, we had a number of people who were interested in this presentation, but were not able to join us live. So, this will be posted to my YouTube tomorrow, and if either of you have a YouTube channel that you want to post to, I'll, I can share the video with you. Okay, definitely. Very good. Well, I enjoyed working with you, Mary, and thank you, Sarah, for the opportunity of these webinars. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. hay evaluation and hay quality is something that it, it can really make or break your operation. Um, and so ensuring that we're feeding you know good quality hay at the right appropriate times um, is going to be key in, in ensuring that success. Um, and especially, um, you know, as we think of, we're getting into, you know, into fall. So our pastures look pretty good right now, but as they start to kind of dry up and we think about our hay needs, it's, it's really more important to start now um, before you need that hay and making sure you have all your hay sourced um, for the winter. Then when you get to midwinter, you say, oh no, I'm uh, I'm out and my guy, you know, I usually get from doesn't have any, didn't, you know, didn't get as much hay made this year. And so start doing that now. Uh, and then it also gives you time to make sure you're doing the proper analysis uh, and have time to allocate that hay as you need it. So. Yeah, if you really have a good uh, relationship with your seller too, I would add, uh, you know, they would like and, uh, and probably you could get it for a lesser price if you could take the hay directly from the field that they're baling on that day and put it into your storage, it reduces the manpower, the people power assumed with uh, putting it into the seller's storage. So that's uh, something at least to think about uh, uh, if you have a, a relationship that's relatively close to you to allow that to happen. Definitely. And sometimes you may expect to, you know, if you work with the same seller that, you know, they always can store it for me and I can go and get it in the winter. And, um, but sometimes things change. Um, my dad makes a lot of hay. Uh, like I said, we used to have a dairy about, uh, up until about 10 years ago. And so my dad can make really good hay, really good alfalfa hay, sometimes too good. We had an issue with our feeding too hot of hay and too high quality hay to our beef cows. Um, and it was, it was too hot. They, they weren't settling. We were trying to breed them. We had you know, conception issues. Um, but he used to be able to store a lot of hay and this year, uh, his hay, ele his elevator just was, he had, was putting up straw and it just rusted out and broke in half. And he goes, well, I'm not going to be storing hay for people. And, you know, so sometimes those situations change, um, you know, year to year in case equipment, you know, breaks down or uh, something else happens. So you, you want to make sure that you're communicating with, uh, with your seller, um, when you, when you go to buy that hay. So. Well, I will also say say that those years where hay supply is short, uh, hay prices can increase easily 25% from September to February, easily. Oh, yeah. uh, so from a value standpoint, if you have the place to store it, uh, you know, resource it now, Mary, I think that's a very good comment. Right. I know of one farmer last year who was selling his, you know, just hay, you know, just plain old mixed grass hay that had not been tested for $60 a round bale because people were short on hay and they were willing to pay him more for that hay than he was paying for byproducts feed to feed his cows. Yep. yep. Well, well, and, that, and, and this brings us to, and uh, we, did, we were talking about evaluation, but when we get into pricing, it is important. It's really important to know the weight of the bales that you're purchasing and buy it on a ton basis uh, because uh, novices to this may not understand the differences, but believe me, as you work with hay, you understand that I can buy what I call a 40 pound fluff ball 
<laughs> or I can purchase an 80 pound heavyweight. Yep. And so, uh, you know, that, that 80 pound bale ought to cost more on a per ton basis, obviously, as compared to the one that is lesser weight. So that's a good question to ask. And again, I don't have a problem in purchasing by the bale, but let's do the mathematics and start with what is the value per ton first, and then divide it by the number of bales in a ton to get your dollar per bale. Yeah, very good point, Keith. Thank you. Well, I'd well, like any to thank questions you. since the time we've we've talked about some other things, Sarah? So no questions, but I'd like to thank you sure. both for presenting today, and we'll have the recording up tomorrow. And I can share this recording with both of you through Box. And you have a, a survey now? Evaluation? There is a survey. So as people leave, you should, there is a survey that should come up. And just please okay. complete that survey for us. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Keith. Me too.